Okay, I'll do this one. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Uh, SRECon 21 um, panel discussion. Uh, ask us anything about learning from incidents. Um, I hope you brought questions. Um, so this conversation naturally adapts to your, our collective emergent curiosity. Um, I'm going to start by asking our excellent panelists to introduce themselves with just a couple of things. Um, I mean, we can see names and probably companies, but name company role, what your role means to you, and then something brief and surprising about learning from incidents. And we'll let Doc start that conversation. Hi, everyone. So I'm Doc Lorne. Uh, I'm a platform engineer at Articulate. And I've been in the learning from incidents community for maybe four or five years now. Uh, I'm super passionate about it, but it is a additional part of my job rather than the specific part of my job. Um, something that's always surprised me about learning from incidents is just how much there is to learn from an incident that on the surface looks exactly the same as one that you learned from, you know, just two weeks ago. Um, digging into it again, even if it looks just the same, and it'll be a whole different set of um, interesting problems that you can you can share. Thanks, Doc. Emily, will you take our next intro? Yeah, hi, I'm Emily Roop. I am from Twilio. I have been uh, part of the Learning from Incidents community probably for three years or so. Um, I'm an incident commander, which uh, I have a lot of feelings about the title commander, but um, for me, it's kind of a, a good opportunity to command up and be a shield for uh, responders and folks working on an incident to kind of protect that environment for them. And uh, something surprising for me is always um, how when people uh, talk fondly about incidents, they remember the stuff that they did together. And that's one of my kind of favorite nerdy parts of it is um, incidents can be fun team building activities uh, that people have positive memories from. And even the negative stuff can be uh, something that sometime has passed, everyone laughs and enjoys together. So I, it's always surprising. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Josie, will you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Kia ora team. I'm Josie. I work for Zero as a product owner. Um, I've moved into delivery and got involved in incident analysis and learning from there. Um, started with the root cause style analysis and found my way to the learning from incidents community from there. Um, something I'm always surprised about when learning from incidents is all the human and the socio-technical contributors that affect incidents that we might not necessarily see if we're just reading through a Slack channel um, or reading transcripts, but the kind of things you find out when you talk to the responders and you have that kind of one-on-one -on -one human discussion. Thanks very much, Alex. Will you take it next? Yeah, I'm Alex Elman. Uh, I'm an SRE manager at Indeed. Um, I Joined Indeed in 2012 as a system administrator, and in 2017 became a founding member of the SRE team along with Jason. And in 2018, um, through a string of uh, retrospectives I attended that were deeply unsatisfying, I started this journey in learning from incidents, uh, joined the broader community in 2019, and haven't looked back. I would say, to echo what Josie said, uh, LFI really highlights the human component of software. And Dr. Krax's uh, talk yesterday about political science observations and how that um, he's, he's seeing some of that with SRE, I think also underscores that, you know, if our systems are both comprised of humans and computers, then that opens up the whole uh, space of exploration on the human side. So that, that's what I find really interesting about LFI. Uh, John. Hi, uh, my name is John Alsbaugh. I work at a company called Adaptive Capacity Labs. Um, I, I like incidents and analyzing incidents and helping people analyze incidents. Uh, I think the thing that, that strikes me as being the most surprising, if that's the prompt, um, is I'm always surprised about 
when, when, when you're looking into a, into a case, I'm surprised about how many others are surprised about how often the opportunity is for the issue to show up and it doesn't. Uh, so, you know, I'm super excited when people, when people will have some sort of reflection of, wait, so it works like that? Wait, I don't, I don't understand how this has ever worked if it works like that. Uh, or how this even stays up as well as it does. So uh, that, that would be my answer. All right, I think I'll go next and then Beth will ask you to finish up. I'm um, Eric Dodds, a staff site reliability incident analyst. Um, and I've decided that most of my work feels like technical journalism. Um, which is finding and faithfully reporting the stories of other engineers. Uh, there's more to it than that, because I'm still a programmer. Um, I mean, in terms of identity, <laughs> um, but, uh, but definitely feels like technical journalism. Um, for, for the surprising, I'm gonna retell it, one of Allspa's jokes um, from one of his tech talks. Um, Alice and Bob were swimming along talking about Facebook's recent outage. As they pass by Eve, the sea turtle says, morning, how's the water? Alice and Bob nod and wave and go back to talking about DNS and BGP when Alice asks, what the hell is water? <laughs> and I am surprised at how often I feel like I'm asking questions about or drawing attention to the water that we're swimming in. And very often I'm, I'm trying to get management's attention on this thing or, or product's attention on this thing. And they're looking at me like, what the hell is water? <clears throat> um, that's that's my yeah. So that's what surprises me, Beth. If you'll introduce yourself. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Beth Long. I am currently head of product at Jelly.io. I uh, joined Jelly just about a year ago because I've always been obsessed with stories and patterns. And for the last few years, I've been obsessed with incidents. And so the chance to unify those three things in one uh, one place was really exciting to me. So I, know, uh, I joined initially as an engineer and then moved into product. And that's been really exciting to me because I've been passionate for a long time about um, the ways that people in the product sphere can uh, make much richer use of the insights that come out of incidents and can uh, you know, shift their perspective. And so the opportunity to actually do that at Jelly um, and to build a product that really deeply understands what it's like at the sharp end um, and, and surface those insights in, uh, in novel ways was really exciting to me. So uh, I think my surprising thing about incidents, it's, it's no longer surprising to me, but it's something that, that always gets people's attention when I talk to them about it, um, is an insight from the, uh, the classic paper by one of our guests here, Dr. Cook, uh, which is that incidents are not a sign that you're failing, they're a sign that you're succeeding and that the only way to stop having them is to die. Uh, so shifting that perspective from uh, incidents being something that we have to get rid of and we have to like drive down all of our metrics so that we have like as few incidents as possible and instead seeing them as a really rich learning opportunity. Thanks very much. So that is the group of people who are primed to answer your questions. And I'm hoping y'all brought some questions. Uh, so I would like to take a moment to actually shut up and wait for someone else to, to speak up a question and invite you to do that verbally. <laughs> um, although uh, if you prefer, you're welcome to also type it into the chat. I've got a question if I can. Um, Beth, I really love what you're just saying, how like using incidents to influence product and generally in incident reviews and things like that. I find it's very centra centralized on the engineering side. Like how do you, what's your best way of bringing product into that and like kind of spreading the value to, to product as well? That's, that's the big question, and I'll, I'll be really keen to hear what other folks on the panel um, have to say about that. From my perspective, 
Um, within Jelly, it's uh, it's having the understanding that everything we're doing is is the product. You know, there's not like a product roadmap and then the everything else roadmap, right? There's like everything that we're doing is the product, and so understanding how things fail, understanding um, how our expectations are misaligned um, is is really great for me in my product role within Jelly to understand. Um, how we're how we can better calibrate as we build the product, um, but then as we're building a product that helps people understand their incidents, uh, one of our goals is really to help people in product understand um, that uh, even things like uh, you know how well can we deliver, how quickly can we deliver, what are the things that are stopping us from having the kind of flow that we want as an organization. Um, I think building building that understanding within the industry at large is going to be really important and letting letting product managers understand the signals that they can be getting from incidents that that they're you know they're currently wasting because they don't yet have the tools for for making sense of that and then on the flip side for engineers to understand how to communicate to people outside of their realm and to kind of distill you know out of the out of all the little nitty-gritty complexities like you don't need to get into the details of you know why this particular dns issue brought everything to a halt but you do need to be able to translate that into the uh, the language of product so that they can then make sense of it. Josie, you seem like an obvious person to offer a thought on this. Sure. Yeah, I have a, I have a lot of thoughts on getting products more involved in um, incident learnings. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the key things is bringing the focus in the incident review itself away from to-do lists and like they've said, the, the technical aspects in their in nitty gritty, but bringing it out so it's a bit more of a broad scope of what makes the system complex rather than a narrow view of how should it work and how did it go wrong. Um, keeping that scope um, or highlighting that there are lots of factors that can go into these. It's not as simple as this one DNS, this tiny PGP change, um, how complex the systems are really underscores how much in product we need to be aware of when we are talking about how do we grow our products and whether that growth work is through um, building new features or whether it's through maintaining our existing features or, or focusing on performance elements. Um, we have to have that understanding of how complex what we're responsible for really is so that we can um, kind of lead with confidence for one and, and make sure that our systems are uh, adaptable and resilient, not so much that they we never have incidents because that's absolutely never going to be possible. And and I liked what they said about that being a, a measure of success, not a not a kind of marker of failures. Completely agree there. Um, but if we understand how complex that system is in the first place, um, again, not at the nitty gritty, but at that broad scope, then we can build that empathy with the responders of an incident, with the engineers that are building these systems and supporting them, um, so that we can really talk about our product in a, a more holistic view. Any of our other panelists want to take a swing at that? I've never been a product manager, but I, I see kind of the challenges of the job. There's like an almost a limitless list of things that can be worked on. And so I see a lot of their job as attention management or attention delegation. And efficiency is, is, is a big part of delivering uh, on a product roadmap. And I think learning from incidents can help uh, to direct some of that attention in, in ways that would normally not uh, bubble up to the top. And for a product manager, I, I'd imagine that's a really important um, thing to have that you wouldn't normally have if you didn't have something like an LFI program. I think I'll move on to our next question. <clears throat> uh, uh, Luna Sanchez uh, asked this question in um, the chat. Um, how does one go about measuring, not necessarily with a number, how successful an org is in learning from incidents? Um, I don't mean only the impact on actual incidents, but other things like team expertise, et cetera. Put 
this one to get us started. Um, I find like a really awesome measure of how successful we are at learning is sort of how many people jump into the room to learn from an incident who weren't directly involved in the incident. Um, I, I really like to make those meetings as public as possible for, for anyone to come in and taking a little read of the, the Zoom chat and seeing, you know, who's who's new, who's who's interested, who's jumping in there, um, who's sort of capitalizing on those opportunities. And when you see more and more people from outside of the direct blast radius of the incident jumping in, that's when you know that learning is uh, prioritized by people. They made time out of their day to go do something that's not directly relevant to their job, but also prioritized by the company and um, valuable for their you know, internal and personal growth. Yeah, I, uh, I would add, uh, actually, I, I wouldn't add anything to what Doug said, because uh, that's exactly it. Uh, I would say that um, certainly attendance, right? Something we know about, especially when it comes to, well, really any, any modern business, people don't pay attention to things that they aren't interested in unless they're forced to, to to pay attention, right? Um, and uh, they, which means they don't attend meetings and they don't think they're gonna get something out of it. So if they voluntarily show up for a meeting, like, like Duck points out, that's a very, very strong signal. And, uh, it, and if you were to look at it the other way, all of the incidents you're not having are a result of how people understand the system, at least how it's intended to work, how it, how it does work, it's always be incomplete, but you'll see it in, in code comments. Uh, you know, uh, this, this little bit here, this function here looks, might look really weird, but there's a good reason for it. Here's, here's, here's why, blah, 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 right? Um, when people are writing new features and fixing old features and fixing bugs and all that sort of thing, they take with them uh, uh, in, into those activities their experience. And if you can broaden the experience that, that they have, broaden, set up the conditions where they can uh, understand um, perhaps even surprising things, then that'll all, uh, that's, that's a good uh, signal, I would say, a, a marker um, that that learning has a chance to take place. Uh, uh, measuring learning is a very difficult <laughs> uh, activity, um, but what you can do is uh, you can identify uh, things that are happening that give you a sense that directionally learning at least has a good shot of of, of taking place. I think uh, Amy Toby tweeted this yesterday and it's a, a better answer to this than I'll have. That's essentially that if anything, if the only thing you get out of uh, incident analysis is that the people who were in it are more comfortable now talking about your failures than they were before, then that's it, you've succeeded. And that can be teeny tiny in that like, you know, we have more people that are joining and participating and the people who are asking questions aren't directors, they're not architects, it's the people who are on call who are asking questions and feel comfortable doing that. Um, every time that happens, every time I see like an L2 be like, yeah, but what about this? How does this work? It's like, oh, we're, we're doing it, we're another step closer. So it's, it's those, those really small successes that you have to pay attention to that build that momentum that have people joining who aren't necessarily involved just because you've gotten them hooked on the curiosity. I have another, which, which isn't exactly a measure. It's more a gut feel that I'm looking for. Um, and uh, it's unfortunately a long play. I'm looking for change in organizational behavior. Like that'll be the evidence that we've been successful at learning and a learning practice as if organization prioritizes um, robustness and um, the, the um, on-demand um, professional development that goes like, that's part of like sees, sees the retro as a professional development 
activity, those are the signals that of like wild success that I'm looking for. But I think that I won't, I, I don't think I'll see those on a quarterly cycle. Um, Anybody else want in on that or should we move to the next question? We got some good questions coming. Um, Colette asked, what's the most difficult part of your job? Who's taking it? I'll lead with stealing from Alex because I loved his phrase about directing attention. And I think I think that really captured what's so valuable about incidents. And I would say that in general, in my role, the most difficult thing is directing attention. It's like there are 8 million things I could be focused on. What are the things that I that I should be focused on? Um, and so I, I I sometimes talk about incidents as a dowsing rod that help you kind of figure out, okay, of all the complexity I'm wrangling, where can I actually make, you know, get some, get something productive? Where can I find water? Um, so yeah, I'd say just knowing how to direct attention is, is probably the biggest challenge. I, I might cheat a little bit in my answer, and it's actually one of the upcoming questions. And it is that building that culture of learning within an organization is the hardest part, I think. It's it's really hard to get both the like executive upper management buy-in, but also that grassroots people on the ground involved in the incidents buy into the process to have that culture of learning. I think you need both parts to be really quite strong to make a really good progress. I think if you're one person on your own who cares about this stuff in, in a passionate way, it can be really, really hard to make progress and it can be internally quite um, quite a struggle as well to have that passion met within the organization. You know, I find learning from incidents is, is my passion and my job and it can be a, a lonely place to be and, and building that culture is really hard because it is, people having to take time and attention and dedication and bring that into their organization. Um, and it's, it's hard work, yeah. Yeah, if I can piggyback on that, the time, this time thing is, it pushes buttons for me, but it's, uh, we're all so strapped for time um, Lauren Hochstein in a couple of podcasts recently sort of drilled in on a point I want to draw here, which is, um, you know, we, we have these narrow metrics that we're trying to collect about incidents. And as he put it, you know, every minute that somebody's talking about what minute this incident started or what minute that incident ended. And do we categorize this as a, as a DNS failure or was it the disk filling up or was it the logging problem? Like all of that time is, is waste <laughs> to try to get metrics that are going to help us make a decision. Um, and it's really hard to move the culture away from this um, desperate longing for, you know, crisp numbers that we could measure to get some, some line on a dashboard to cross a threshold and tell us, oh, now invest in re re reliability now. <laughs> um, uh, so that. Uh, moving the culture there around investing the time to learn, that feels like the hardest obstacle. If I could, uh, I'd like to take a shot at this. Uh, so if I were to kind of want to split this question out, because it's a good one, that, so there's, what's a difficult part of doing incident analysis? And then there's what's the difficult part of convincing people that doing incident analysis is worth it. And I think if we were to separate those two things, uh, it, it, might be, it might be worthwhile. Um, I would say that on, on the former, um, uh, that is to say, what is difficult um, uh, of doing incident analysis? I mean, the short answer is all of it. This is really hard work to do. Um, and there is no, uh, you know, unlike, uh, 
like a, a unit test that passes or fails. Doing incident analysis is, uh, is, is one of many uh, iterations and, and, and practice uh, experiences that help you, you know, sort of, uh, uh, sort of tune trade-offs. So for example, you want the write-up to be as uh, useful and interesting and uh, 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 productive for the broadest audience. So you have uh, judgments, um, you'll have to make judgments on how technically, technically deep uh, in general, a write-up would be. Um, if it's too vague, then you've lost a big part of the audience. If it's too, uh, if it's, if it's too detailed, you've lost a different part of the audience. Uh, what part of the incident, which, which, which themes are, uh, are, are salient enough, are, 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 are uh, productive enough to pull threads on? And which are not, which are you're going to be, you know, you're going to, there's no uh, objective, right? Uh, there's no objective stop rule. You can continue on interviewing people, you continue on doing the analysis um, in perpetuity. Um, and so those sorts of trade offs, same thing comes with interviewing and, 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 and collating and synthesizing, and there's always more data. Um, those are judgments, and 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 the only way you get good at that is uh, is practice. Um, I'll, I'll I'll report back on when I feel like I'm good at it. Yet um, the, the 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 second part again, I think, is convincing people that it's worth it. Um, I can't say that I have any good answers there. Uh, I will just say. Uh, it may sound like a bit of a smart aleck answer, which is in the wake of a reasonably visible accident, we do find, and I'll speak as a consultant here, um, we do find that uh, people do seem to be motivated to make some progress, even if they have no idea what that looks like, largely because the incident, you know, poked them in, in such a way that wallets and budgets seem to open up. Um, it's, a, it's a very blunt method of persuasion, but uh, it does happen. Uh, it occurs naturally in the wild. We, we kind of like to say it in, in the Alpha community that we write our incidents to be read, not filed. And you don't just mean like doing being good about advertising the write-up, it's it's the way that you write it. So a lot of RCAs or accident reports are written from this like omniscient first person perspective as if I'm the all knowing reporter of what's going on. I'm gonna be very, you know, factual and by the book. It's, those are not engaging, to, you know, I can't get past a page of something like that. But if instead you write it as this multi-perspective narrative, like it's a piece of narrative nonfiction or a piece of fiction, um, that draws people in, that's really compelling. And that's the kind of thing that'll get passed around and referred to. Oh, like in the April incident write-up, you know, this, this, and this, it'll be referred to maybe even years later. And uh, that's hard work. It's hard to do that, but it's something you can get really good at. That feels really connected to what you were saying at the start of the call, Emily, about incidents being a bonding experience. Like if we can get our write-ups to, to help the organization bond around the incidents in some way, um, that would be wild success too. Yeah, they become a story that you tell. Incidents always become a story that you tell to other people. And so if the write-up can somehow embody that like piece of like, oh my gosh, let me tell you about this one time. Everybody loves gossip. If you make your incident write-up, basically some some hot internal goss, you know, that's stuff that people want to read because it's compelling and they care about it. it it's meaningful to them. Emily, I think you just, uh, you, you, you just inadvertently gave an excellent answer to Luna's question earlier, which is things are going well when those stories are 
do get told. Couldn't agree more. Does anyone else want to have a go at the split question that John offered us? The what's hard about the doing the work versus what's hard about John, what was the second question? What's hard about persuading people oh. to let us do it? I don't know. I I, I, I don't remember. I Water under the river. The, the one part, the what's hard about doing the work, for me at least, um, moving from organization to organization is building trust. Um, I think that we probably don't talk about that uh, enough in like the LFI community of there, there has to be trust built between you and the people that you're interviewing, um, that you're writing up this incident, because you're taking something that was, you know, in their minds, like a thing that happened to them, and as a third party asking them questions and, and trying to extract information and understand how they felt the decisions that they made. And so there has to be um, trust built there. And that's, that's hard. You can't make people trust you. You have to, to build it. You can't kind of force it. So um, proving out that you are um, an advocate and a teammate and someone that they can trust to kind of give this information to and that you will do good by them and do right by them to make sure that you're telling their story in a truthful way, but also a way that helps everyone learn from it is for me, very difficult. <laughs> that's that's a challenge. That's a real human interaction component uh, that we all struggle with on a daily basis. And it's just kind of turned up to 11 when you're doing um, incident analysis as someone who's not directly already a part of that team. Yeah, and I think it points to the, the why metrics can't get us the measurement we need for the improvement in learning from incidents because you can't you can't as you say you can't make somebody trust you and that's a critical ingredient to being successful so how long is it going to take to earn that trust i can't schedule that for you it, it, it's it's delicate and um if you get it wrong it could be it could do irreversible damage so for example, the interview room, the place that we discuss to you know, get someone's description, have their unique perspective. If that, that trust is breached in some way, if, if they're hearing about from like a VP, something they said in that interview room, um, they'll never want to talk to you again. So establishing trust is running interference when someone asks for the interview materials, making sure that they're not inadvertently accessible by other people. And if you do that, um, the more you, the longer you do that, the more and more trust people will have, and you'll know that it's working when the things that people tell you in the interview, they'll never tell anyone else. They'll they'll talk up, they'll use expletives, they'll they'll name names, they'll um, show emotion, they might cry. Uh, that's how you know that there's trust there that you're cultivating. <laughs> also, not things I want to put out as metrics <laughs> the, the, violate the trust, right? <laughs> um, all right, I think I'll take that moment of pause to move on to our next question, which I actually, I'm gonna combine two questions because I think they're related. Um, Spike asks, a lot of orgs, teams, engineers are very fixed on finding, uh, fixated on finding root cause and concrete action items as the primary output. Um, because they're seen as measurable, um, what have been your experiences with this or any advice on how to balance that pressure to moving towards learning from incidents? And the companion is how do you build a culture of learning around incidents when the company leadership is resistant to the change? I know where we are and where, we want, where I want us to get to, but the path to get there is a mystery. Um, for example, would bringing outside help or consulting, um, since they might have more time and expertise in motivating the changes. Um, those look like the same thing as it's about persuading someone that the investment in learning from incidents is valuable. Um, and it's the someone is a fellow engineer close to the sharp end or a leader farther from the sharp end. Anybody want to talk about how you've done that? take a shot at, uh, I guess, maybe narrowly 
to Spike's question, um, one way to think about it, one way to consider is that action items or follow-ups or countermeasures, those will happen. Those are, those, it, in fact, it would be really weird if people were resistant to that, that happening. I think the point that, that Spike's, I think, uh, getting at, which is, are, is the production of those being used uh, as, a, as, a, as a measure of somehow of, of quality. Um, there's uh, one way to think about it is how good are they? Uh, less how many are them? Or how, 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 uh, does, it, does it matter how many you have? Uh, it may, uh, or at least in the eyes of the organization you're in, how many you have might somehow be important. Um, to some people, uh, are they completed, or you know, or are they, uh, or they marked as won't fix, or that sort of thing? The quality aspect of 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 what is done, of what is actually done, you know, uh, it, what we find is engineers on call tend to do things that help um, more often than they don't. Um, the so I just on the, on the, I guess on the topic of, uh, I, I think that Spike is getting it, which is, well, if Jira tickets are there and you can count them and they're really easy and there's different ways that you can count them, this isn't categorized and that sort of thing. Hey, let's, let's count this thing and we'll use that because that's a number we can, and that's that some numbers are higher than others and we'll use that as some, eh, the, if you poke at that just a little bit, just scratch a little bit beneath, uh, under the surface, um, pick out what Lauren Hochstein has, I think, tried to convince uh, and, and remind people of, on, I think, on a weekly basis for the last couple of years, which is uh, what follow-up action items from one incident turn into contributors or triggers in following incidents. You can count those too, if you want. You could count how, you know, and so uh, does that help? I'm not entirely sure it is. There's fixing and there's learning. You could probably fix things if you have a better understanding of what you're fixing and how you're, what the opportunities are to, to, um, to fix it. I don't really worry personally about action items getting done. In fact, all, when, when you look closely at incidents, there's lots of incidents where there's uh, right immediately after an incident, engineers may say, whew, okay, well, glad that's over. Hey, so uh, I'm gonna just gonna, I'm gonna do this thing. I'm gonna do this thing right now because I don't wanna, because it's easy to do and it's straightforward and uh, it can, you know, I just don't wanna, I just wanna get to sleep tonight. So it's, you know, sort of fine. Those sometimes don't get, don't get even counted as action items. So let me make it, so let me restate this. The thing that literally could not wait for a postmortem meeting was the thing that was so important that there wasn't, I'm not even gonna make a ticket for this because shit just broke, it's on fire. I'm gonna just do this, uh, isn't counted. So again, like, I, again, there's, there's I, I wish that there was, I had a solution to, what is it? Uh, Goodhart's law or, or something like that. Um, uh, but I don't think I don't think that there is the the there's some amount of success that you might get depending on how willing your people in charge who measure these things are uh, are, are are open to it. Um, but at, out of out of when you ever have a number, where's the denominator? Is a very good question, and I think I think um, out of how many incidents should we have out of how many tickets should we have right i don't know can't really measure something on the absence of them happening pretty sure i didn't answer any of spike's questions but i just did some talking 
to follow on from, from what John's saying, um, we've definitely seen in recent reviews where we've done those, the engineers have absolutely had that, I need to do this new work to get to sleep tonight following an incident and have and those those actions have been taken well before the, the review meeting. Um, and yet when you get into the review, that last five minutes when you finished all the discussion points, talked about your themes and you're wrapping up, you have someone go, well, but what are our actions? What are we doing next? Um, which we've started calling action panic. Um, that people feel like they need that, that to-do list at the end of them, at the end of the review to say, this review was useful, I have my to-do list, off we go. Um, but um, I do think that there's that element of, of looking kind of one step back from where these um, kind of needs for those root causes, these to-do lists um, come from. Um, so on the root cause side, why do we feel like we need to come up with actions? Why do we feel like we need to, to capture all of those? And it kind of feels like it comes back to that. We feel we need to be perfect in a lot of these situations. If only we'd done these to-do list items before the incident happened, the incident wouldn't have happened type things. How can we prevent this? Um, and I think we see the same on the building the culture of learning around incidents in the leadership side. Um, how do we, uh, we may be resistant to change. We may want to have everything perfect and have everything roadmapped and all these ideas ready to go before we try and implement those changes and change our culture. Um, so I see a lot of this as a lot of these uh, difficult parts of incident reviews as breaking down that need to be perfect um, and that need to have all the answers before we have the, the incident in the first place. Um, and that can be from a leadership perspective, like John's saying, who's measuring those, um, those ticket counts, who's measuring the number of JIRA tickets we have at the end of an incident, um, and can we change their perspective, perspective of that to-do list means this could have been prevented, therefore we could have been perfect if we'd only tried a little bit harder. Um, and on the, on the sharp end and the engineering side, if, when we're looking at that root cause, it feels like the same, the same thing. If only we'd, if we dig enough, we'll find one single contributor that if we only solve that, then we'll never have another incident again. Um, so I guess on the two sides of that and how to um, how to find a balance and how to um, move away from that pressure. Um, I find definitely a lot of the, the kind of regular meeting uh, etiquettes and organizations apply to these. So things like setting expectations from the start of a review. Of a review. If you've got a, an, in, an incident that's happened and you're looking to do the review a week later, setting expectations really on that hey, we're not going to be looking for a big to-do list here. We're not going to be documenting everything and coming up with action items. We're going to be here to talk about learning and any conversations that go down the action side. We might entertain them. We might continue those conversations or we might put them in the parking lot, come back to them later, book a follow-up meeting when you've got the appropriate people there. Um, it's often in the reviews. Um, I can't remember who said it early on. It might have been Emily or it might have been Duck, but people will get that value from, will, will attend what they find to be valuable. Um, so in that review, you may not have all the people that are necessary to make those decisions about what the next steps are. If, if it's a really complex system, you may need people from different teams, you may need people from different levels of the organization to make those decisions and really get that buy-in. So setting that expectation from the start that we're not here to find actions, but if we do think that there's an avenue that we could pursue further that would help build resilience into the team and build our adaptivity, we'll set up a separate time for that and we'll investigate that with the, with the full context and with the full um, team that's needed to, to go down that side. So like build off those thoughts. I, I totally agree that it's um, a great, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that I feel like if you've got a culture where root cause analysis and five whys, um, when those things are important to your your team and that they, they really value them, it's they are caring about learning from incidents. They're, they're just doing it in the old fashioned way. Um, and I don't think there's anything that wrong from starting from that point. Um, it's, it is a great starting point and it's a pl great place to kick off from because you've, you've got people who are engaged in that process and care about it. Um, to move away from it, I, I like to offer an experiment and just say, hey, I want to I want to try this new way. I heard about this new way of doing and learning from incidents. Um, can we put root cause analysis to the side for this incident and just have a go at my way um, and, and try run with that? It does require putting in a lot of like upfront effort and um, a lot of 
potential like political capital to, to go down that path. Um, but I think if you've got a, a team who cares about root cause analysis, you've got a team who, look, who cares about fixing things, who wants to be perfect, who wants to find that one thing that went wrong so they can make it better. Um, and you can use that to drive a learning from incidents process um, by just offering some experiments, some iteration, you know, it's that um, learn fast, make changes process, just be like, yeah, let's, let's try some new things um, and engage with that with your team. And I find that a really useful way to, to move forward from older approaches that are still valuable, but you want to, you want to change. That's the, I mean, the like, not good answer that I was going to give is essentially like, know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know, like pick your battles and understand that like, you're not just going to like run in and have like a huge victory because you get everyone to stop using the word root cause and you get everyone to stop using five whys and you've done it. And it's, it's great. Like it's going to be incremental. And if, if five whys and root cause are like heavily baked into the culture, which that's a component that we have do them really well with them and show them the possibilities of exploration that lie outside the bounds that they're operating in. You know, show them is exactly what Duck is saying is, you know, show them the possibilities and the, and the ways to go beyond what they're looking at, because it's, you know, they're, they're doing these things because this is what has been taught. This has been a part of the industry. And if you broaden people's horizons, people are genuinely curious and they want to dig further into things. They don't usually want to stop with one root cause that checks the box for someone somewhere. But for the curious engineers whose code this is, it, it doesn't typically satisfy them. So take those incremental victories and kind of choose what is important to you and understand that it's it's going to take time, but each step a little bit closer of, you know, if we start using the phrase root causes is even, a, you know, a step in the right direction because you've, you've gotten a plural into their, or into their vocabulary. So it's okay if you don't feel like you're having like a sweeping victory around it. It's, it's going to take time and that can be exhausting, but it's also incredibly valuable as you start seeing the progress they're making. I feel like there's a brilliant segue here to um, Dr. Cook's question for us. Um, unless y'all had like before I interrupt, but uh, Richard Cook asks for those of you who feel like you have moved the needle in your organization with regards to learning from incidents. One, how long did it take? Two, when did you first have to do a review of a really high value incident? I kind of want to put Alex on the spot for this one because you persuaded Jason. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so, you know, I started really looking into uh, getting better at learning from incidents in the summer of 2018. And I just thought it would be like a couple week project where maybe I just made the template better and then I'd be done. And that couldn't have been further from the truth. The more I dug, the more I realized how a lot of these disparate ideas are connected and how, how far we have to go. And that kind of led to a year later wanting to start a program within SRE. And I wrote up a charter and I, I circulated around, you know, to the other SRE managers and I got light pushback, like, wait, this is what SREs are supposed to be doing anyway. Like this is part, should be part of our team charter. True, but uh, there are hundreds of focus areas for SRE. Some of them need more uh, attention and acceleration than others. And so I looked at it as an incubator program to accelerate this practice within SRE. And I would say, so I got, you know, buy-in from the other, uh, other managers and, you know, Jason, my manager, I brought him aboard. And once he started, you know, seeing the value of this, it kind of had a snowball effect. And, you know, there's a, there was a lot of willingness at Indeed already to try it. And I would say it was about a year before I felt like I started seeing um, the needle move. I don't think we'll ever be done, but I definitely, I would say it took about a year. And, you know, I, I think there are still parts of the company that aren't really aware of, of it. And I think over communicating is key. 
when you over communicate, there's some people that are going to kind of get sick of your message, but that's the only way to really make sure that other parts of the organization um, kind of hear what you have to say and, and start trying things out. Josie, do you have a story along these lines about persuade? Like how, how does how does somebody in product get this going? Um, so I was lucky enough to join Zero when there's already a great learning from instance community um, established um, our SRE team and um, various incident aficionados across the organization have this, this learning from instant culture. Um, but there's definitely that, like Alex says, that you end up with this core group that are super invested and really interested in learning from incidents and want to spread that message. And it does take um, quite a lot to radiate it out to different areas of the business. So I think it's it's been uh, the area that I work in, we're doing a bit of a, a kind of push to move away from some more traditional aspects that are a little bit maybe blame heavy, a little bit um, uh, preventative measures rather than learning measures um, and I think the the key to that has been kindness and empathy with those with those team members of um, how do we look at this less as a everyone needs to adopt this brand new process and we need to, to be consistent across the whole of the board uh, global is a zero is a global business with a diversity of approach um, so mandating that everybody follows this one set process and it's perfect every time is, is not going to be reasonable. So how do we radiate out the, um, the message and the, the benefits of taking a learning approach to areas that haven't heard that message yet and maybe are a little bit re um, reluctant to do so. Um, and that empathy and, and taking the human approach has definitely been it. Is let's, how can we understand other areas' pain points? How can we build better services for our internal customers and our external customers? How can we learn from them? And almost taking a product continuous discovery approach to, um, to learning from incidents. Of, in the product world, we want to constantly be interviewing our customers and we want to be talking to them daily or weekly or monthly at least and, and learning from what is it that they really want. We can do the same internally. Um, talk to our engineers. What do you really want? Talk to our product, uh, our business analysts, our product owners. What would make your day to day easier? What would make your um, your processes easier? How can we take these incidents as as um, a, a chance to review internal sides and um, learn from them and and implement those improvements that way? Um, I'm definitely seeing some the needle moving somewhat on that. Um, it's going to be a long process and um, similar to radiating the message out as a wholesale process change, it's not going to work for all areas, but taking the empathetic approach is, is um, so far working pretty well. We are right up to the end of our time together. But I, um, Doc, it seems like some of your answers earlier today suggest you've got a lens on long path to adoption. I wonder if you can say something about that in a few minutes to wrap us up. Yeah, um, how long it takes to move the needle. I would say I'm at two years and counting and the needle's still just twitching. Um, <laughs> and we've, we've brought in uh, various consultants. Um, we've, we've worked really hard to try and change the culture. And I think it's it's a slow process that, that yeah, it really does require that buy-in from both ends. Um, and it requires building that trust and building that um, that human connection, that that empathy, that that understanding that we're all here together to learn you know we don't we don't enter our industries fully formed and knowing everything um we, we we grow throughout a career a staff engineer can learn from a junior engineer um and and we need to be embracing that uh together as an industry and we need to be encouraging that within our companies and within our our social circles and our conference circles um and i think that's what that's what all of us here uh, believe in I don't feel like I can say anything better to close us out. <laughs> Thank you everyone for your um, time and attention. Really appreciate that you've 
joined us. Um, needless to say, those of us on the panel were pretty dang excited about learning from incidents. And the more of you all that are excited about it, the easier it is for us to persuade all of our organizations that it's worth their time and money. Um, so this is part of the deal. And thank you very much. And we're, we're all pretty accessible too. So if, if you are really earnestly wanting to bring a program like this to your company, reach out to any of us and uh, we'll definitely you know, do everything we can to support you and help you. Awesome, thank you. I'm gonna leave the video open for a little bit, but I'll stop the recording. <laughs>